Hi folks, welcome to another episode of NYC CNC. Super excited. We are gonna start a series here on the fourth axis with the Tormach. To take a step back, when I bought my Tormach about four years ago, I didn't buy the fourth axis at the time. Uh, I sort of wanted to, but it was a combination of not wanting to bite off more than I could chew. And you know, it's uh, the Tormachs are a great value, but it is still uh, a big check to write. And so I held off. And since then, I've always been fascinated by them. And I've been poking around and trying to learn more about them. And the other reason I'm really excited to do this little series is I feel like it's going back to what I used to do so much of, which is really showing how to do stuff the right way and how to learn the right way and how to learn intelligently, which I think is leveraging off of other people's work and digesting stuff in a, a practical manner. And I think hopefully this video series is going to be a much better way than trying to look through a manual or a book or, or stumble along on your own. We're going to go, uh, we're going to divide this up into a couple different videos. We're going to today go through installing the fourth axis on the machine. You'll get it up and running. I'll probably talk a little bit about the fourth axis that I purchased. Tormach makes a few different ones. And then we're going to do some uh, cam work and sprut cam. That's definitely something that I took some learning. It took a little few tricks, but, uh, and I'm no expert on it, I'll admit. So hopefully though, you'll get enough of a running start from showing what I've learned to both machine 2D contours as well as, well as complex geometry, you know, sort of water lining, uh, pocketing and so forth. And uh, so the second video will be the cam. Then the third video, we're gonna make some parts. Uh, fourth axis are awesome. I've talked about it before. Folks, we live in an awesome era. To, to, for this kind of an investment, to be able to do fourth axis machining, fourth axis simultaneous machining, the possibilities are endless. Tormach, it's, it's a reason why I love them as a company. They're putting this stuff out there. Uh, Tormach, you know, maybe the precision is you know, not quite the same as, say, a Haas or VMC fourth axis, but it's also you know, something like one-tenth the price. Really not that much of a capital outlay for the functionality you've got behind it. And as you can see here, Tormach has done some really cool stuff. I don't think they ever brought this one to, uh, to market, but this idea of using a fourth axis as a trunnion device, and there's, there's a lot of different ways. Fourth axis just isn't for certain complex geometries. It can mean being able to machine things on three different sides in one operation. I, uh, I finally bit the bullet and bought one because, as you guys saw a few months ago, I was doing engraving work on barrels, and it actually worked without the fourth axis. There wasn't enough um, contour to the barrel that would create a, a problem on the appearance of the machining but nevertheless, it made me realize now's the time to do it. The price is right on these things. It's a great skill set to have in the shop. In fact, when I was at that auction uh, buying the Bridgeport, someone came up to me and said, hey, do you, can you do fourth axis machine work? And this is a guy who's got a you know, multi, you know, $50,000, $60,000, I think it was a uh, Mazak. And he doesn't have a fourth for it. And, and to be able to say, yeah, I can do some fourth stuff. Pretty cool. So without further ado, uh, let's dive in. I'm also a little self-conscious, I'll admit, because most of the videos I've been doing for the past year, I really own the content. I've practiced, I've rehearsed, it's really polished. This is gonna be a little bit more, uh, you know, we're gonna do this together. So um, well, let's dive in. First things first, they make six different rotary tables. I thought that was frustrating. What is the difference? Here's my understanding and talking to Andy and the research. First two options are the same as the second two options. They just have a tilting feature. The tilting feature is not CNC controlled. It is a manual tilt. I didn't like that for two reasons. Number one, I'd rather have something that's trammed in and trued in and I don't have an extra play option to it. And I don't foresee, at least right now, uh, the need to do any tilting type of work where it's pitched up. It also has to ship freight and these could ship UPS. Um, so I bought the eight inch one you see here. It is, as I understand it, quite similar to the six inch one, except a little bit bigger. And then there are two more called the super spacers. And this threw me off because I thought, well, what's the difference? Are these better quality? Are they, uh, you know, what's up? And so my understanding again is the super spacers are better if you have a tool changer because they more naturally fit on the right hand side of the machine. Your tool changer is on the left. Whereas, um, the one I got is probably better suited for the left. Again, this wasn't important to me. I don't have a tool changer, don't envision getting one. And uh, I think, again, these were a little bit more expensive or they maybe have to ship freight. 
Um, they have, a, I think they have a larger through bore, so definitely check it out. But the important thing is, it's not like this is a better quality or materially better crazy functionality and so forth. Uh, so don't overthink that one. Um, now the first things you got to do in the manual are they talk about oh, backlash and oiling. Let's do that together so that you don't have to sit here and read through this machine manual. And by the way, the best thing you can do with this manual um, is go ahead and throw it away. Uh, no joking aside, it's uh, it's not, not bad, but you can go to the NYC CNC website for this post, the link in the description of the video, and download the PDF, which has all these photos in color. Uh, again, you may not even need it because we're going to go over all this stuff on the video, but uh, having this stuff in color is way better than trying to decipher when it's printed out in black and white. Oiling it first. There is a little spring-loaded dimple here, and there's one right here. And then there's something called the oil reservoir, which we have to go at right here. Now, uh, I'm learning as we go here, if, um, if your dimple is not at the top here, look at this. Rotate this 90, that's intentional. Make sure the, uh, these are loose, these three at least, and your fourth will rotate, actually, quite nicely, to be honest with you. So I put that at the top. You're supposed to oil it in the position you intend to use it. I'm gonna use it in this position if you're laying it flat. You'll, you'll need to do that. I think that has to do with the oil reservoir and having it fill up to the right amount and it'll spill over if you flip it between the two and blah, blah, blah. I went ahead and got most of the Chinese grime off of here with some acetone. Um, you can use whatever you like. Don't tell my wife I used acetone. I have convinced her that I don't like the smell of it so she doesn't do her nails in our bedroom and I've got a good thing going for me, folks, so please don't screw that up. So, um, Let's, oh, they, sorry, they include a little oil can, which is actually quite nice. I was looking around trying to find an empty one, and then I realized, wait a minute here, there's one in the packaging. Uh, use, they list a few different types you can use. I'm going with 30 weight, which is one of the four options, and you just shove this in there to depress the plunger, and the book says, do this until you feel back pressure. So, let's do it. Make sure, uh, make sure I am squirting oil here. Yep. Try to keep it clean so that if it starts leaking out due to back pressure, I can uh, notice. Uh, I, I gotta think rotating it can't help, can't hurt to uh, distribute the oil. Um, this is one of the reasons why hopefully the video will prove helpful and hopefully we're going to learn something here because I don't really know how uh, much to do here. You know what, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do the side one. Actually, it'll be easier to have it at a 9 o'clock. Rotates really nicely, really does. Well, there's certainly an amount of oil in there. Uh, let's move on to this oil reservoir or oil plug here and see what we got. Be careful not to get any of this residual paint or chips down into the oil plug. So, so, so get this, the directions read, and I'll read them for you again so you don't have to use the manual. With the table in the horizontal position, if you're using the table horizontally, Fill the reservoir until the sight glass shows the oil in the middle of the window. Your sight glass is right here. Okay, I can, I can work with that, but we're not going to use it in the horizontal position. We're going to use it in the vertical. So if you're using the vertical position, fill the reservoir until oil begins to leak out the bottom of the table. That's not exactly my favorite way to do this. So as far as I can tell, that's still bone dry in there. So let's grab our oil and obviously a funnel. And let's see what happens here. If someone sees it leaking oil before I do, yell. Oh, there it's leaking. There I see it. There's a lot. Oh, I probably did one too many. So, if you guys just watched, uh, hopefully that gives you some idea of how much to put in and uh, where it's going to overflow from. Let me deal with that right now. 
Okay, well, lesson learned there. Not the worst uh, thing in the world, but it is pretty clear that this is an oil pan, and uh, and I obviously overflowed it. So if you look at the line, and this sorry, this bubble is now all the way filled. So if you want to do this a little bit more elegantly than I did, fill it until you start seeing a little bit of oil in there, and then go slow. Uh, again, not the worst thing in the world, but um, no reason for everyone else to make the same mistake I just did. Now let's adjust the backlash. On the upside, it actually pivots around my table quite nicely because I have a miniature oil slick here. So, to adjust the backlash, it doesn't actually appear hard at all. The reading the directions for it, kind of mind numbing. There is a set screw here. Take that all the way out. It protects the actual backlash screw. Now, what you do is, remember our motors like this, it's, Warm gear is engaged. Rotate it, not engaged. If it won't come back like that, let off the tension here, twist it, there you go. So what they say to do is tighten this down until you, they say to hold counterclockwise pressure on this thing and you'll feel resistance. I don't find this is the easiest thing to do and what I'm gonna do is show you is if I, I'm gonna back the screw out a couple turns here. Now, watch, I'm gonna turn this screw and you're gonna see this move right now see that I'm actually rotating that uh, block here I'm actually rotating the motor I grabbed the manual to make sure I don't goof and you need to make sure this is uh, this lever here is loosened so what they say is hold this counterclockwise so putting pressure this way on it and keeping pressure on it tighten the set screw until you slowly feel resistance to this pressure I'm holding. So that's there, that's when it starts to move. The set screw is now against the worm drive. Back this off until you feel no pressure. Right there for me. Finally, retighten a quarter turn. This will leave room for the film oil. So I let my screwdriver's at about 10 o'clock. There I'm at about two o'clock, something like that. What that does, it leaves just enough oil so that, uh, room so that the oil isn't being skimmed off and can stay on there as a coated surface and prevent unnecessary wear and premature blah 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 so that's adjusting backlash now now let's put the uh, screw back in here my guess is that after using this for a little while I want to take a look at that again but that shouldn't be hard to do at all now one question is does this screw rest inside of this hole or does it press against the backlash screw? I'm going to assume it gets snugged up against the backlash screw to keep it in place. Um, check out the comments below if other people are says that, say that's wrong, but that would make sense to me. And uh, our oil spill has calmed down. That's nice. And how she feel? Rotate that. I'm telling you, man, this feels really nice. Um, I like it. Okay, let's head over and deal with the electronics. Next up, go ahead and remove this panel. Four quick screws. That way we can get to the inside where we really need to work. And we'll remove this little guy. Before we feed the wires in, kill power to the machine. Make sure you at least turn this knob off and preferably unplug it from the wall or disconnect from the wall. My connector did not fit in here. So I had to take a deburring tool and just knock off some of the residual paint. No big deal. Now we will take our th four blue wires, stuff them through to start, and then catch the ground, the green ground as well. And like so. Okay, first suggestion. Test these screws out before you even put the black piece in. They really didn't go in well for me. Maybe it's because I have an older Series 2 machine. The, the old screws were not threaded, but rather through screws with nuts on the other side. And you don't want to crack this black connector. So, so again, tap these if you have to, or test the fit out before you get the black thing in here. I finally got this one in, but not particularly fun. Okay, nothing worse than a dull, slow video. Let's speed this up. Take your green wire, shorten it up a hair if you want to, and put this ring terminal on the end and clamp it to that ground bar right there. Take the wire with these two ends with 324, 325, fold it in half 
and cut it in half. Now we're up here in the top left of the cabinet. Wire 325 goes to the one marked A minus, 324 goes to the one marked A plus. I've got a series two and the same is true for series one, which is the, um, they're right up here. If you've got a series three, lucky you, uh, apparently the same thing, I just can't point to it. Okay, installed. For me, that means 325 is on the left, 324 is on the right. You've got the two loose ends still to deal with. Next, to install the actual driver box, you need an M4 screw in the bottom. The book says it came with two. I don't know where mine went. I probably lost them. I put an M4 by 12 in there, back it out a little bit, set the driver on the bottom screw, snug it down and put it in the top screw. For the NEMA 34 fourth axis, which is what we're dealing with on the eight inch, set your jumpers to on, off, 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 on, on, off. So one, Six and seven are on. That's three total that are on. And the others, two, three, four, five, eight, are off. Strip about one eighth of the end of each of these four wires off and then let's snake them through the blue cable carrier. Whoops, don't put those covers uh, on back just yet. We need to plug in the equivalent of this cable, which is actually all the same cable. They just sever it off at certain points. So you find your the gray cable, you'll see it should be tucked in here tug and sure enough tug easily there she sits and it looks like the last two are out but there's here one two three four five six the others appear to have six as well so hopefully that's okay like so and last thing i think we have to wire up is the terminal block connector to the actual controller the blue wires are from top to bottom starting up here three two zero then three two one 322 and 323, so those are all progressive and normal. Then, for no reason that I can understand, they go backwards. 325, then 324. The book says that the position of these two are vital and it'll fry the driver if it's done backwards. So, again, just to reiterate though, 325 is coming from the leftmost side of the board in the top left of the machine that is marked A minus. 324 is the right hand side and it is marked A plus and it comes over here. So 325 is the, the top one, 324 is the bottom one. The book then says you can use a multimeter in, on the ohm resistance setting to detect if you've got the wire set up correctly. You, you obviously have to plug the machine into the fitting over here, uh, but you do not have this plugged into the controller, but rather test. So they said there should be uh, between one and five ohms between 320 and 321. So let's see how I can do this. Settling at about 0.9 was on one. And then it said you should get the same rating between 322 and 323. Good, I do. And you should not get anything between 320 and 322, which I don't. So that's all good. Again, not really clear to me how that test confirms what I guess will immediately fry it, which is that these power guys are, are setting correctly. Uh, so I think we're done here. Let me just make sure. Okay, plug the green thing back into the controller. I hooked the machine back up to power, turned it on. Now before we go play with this thing, make sure this is loose so these are not binding it up uh, intentionally or locking it in place. So that we know that that's loose. Now we can engage the motor and then just slightly tension that thing so this doesn't twist out. And one of the reasons I love making these videos, folks, the manual, at least I didn't see it, doesn't tell you how to jog the freaking thing in Mach 3. I've grabbed another keyboard with a number pad thinking it may be there, and sure enough, for me at least, it's plus and minus. Shift it does rapids, boom, boom. And you can even do, you know, G01A, a, you know, 200, like so. So folks, we got a fourth axis. Stay tuned for tomorrow. I'm going to release the video on Sprutcam Basics for programming the fourth axis.